be on. Tick, tick. Yeah, there we are. All right, so tonight we have with us Brad Gray, uh, a great friend of mine. I know he's not spoken here before, but for those who go, or go to Sardis Lake Christian Camp, uh, he is not a, a stranger. Uh, he is a, a good friend of mine. I know I've said that several times this week already, but really he is a good friend of mine, probably the most genuine guy you will probably ever meet. Uh, he is the head football coach for the Eupora uh, football team and also preaches uh, one of the preachers for the Winona Church. Uh, I'm not going to take up his time because I know he's got a lot he wants to talk to you about tonight, uh, but we're thankful that he is here. Is that too close? Can y'all hear me? Hear me good? All right. Appreciate it. Appreciate that, Greg. Greg is always really too kind. Um, I'm glad to be here. I appreciate the invite to come and to speak. Um, like Greg said, I, I'm a, um, a football coach and a teacher. That's why I like for you guys to be right here. This is kind of my thing. Greg said that it can be pretty much whatever uh, kind of layout. You know, uh, I'd rather teach than I would preach. Um, but um, yeah, Greg, uh, we're we're definitely good friends. Uh, Amanda and um, um, Beth were friends growing up, and then uh, because those two got together with us two, I guess we got to become good friends. But I think people probably think that. But I really treasure um, Greg's friendship. It's always good, especially in the coaching business. But I found out, you know, in the Christian business, it's it's always good to have people you can bounce things off of. And he's always been good to listen to me about some things. And sometimes they can be crazy and stuff. And and then when I entered into the world of preaching and speaking publicly, uh, he's been a major help with that too. So, um, again, I appreciate Greg introducing me. I appreciate his friendship. appreciate the invite. Tonight, uh, the topic I got, and this is... Uh, not my favorite thing to do. Usually what I do is uh, during the week, uh, throughout the week, I pray and read my Bible and then I have a lesson on Sunday. One of the hardest things for me to do is to have somebody uh, that I think a lot of, like Greg, say, hey man, here's the topic. That happens at camp every year. Here's the topic and you got to get the answer right at the end. So if I don't get the answer right at the end, I apologize. I will tell you up front, I don't have all the answers. Um, if you would like to stop me in, you know, during this time, or if I ask questions, feel free to, you know, jump in there. I'm going to just take off and, and go with it as far as um, I think we need to go. And again, if we need to stop and back up, if I don't know the answer, I'll try to find it uh, because I can tell you I always don't. A great, great story. One of my favorites. Um, you can imagine as a football coach using this story. We'll be in First Samuel chapter 17 tonight, talking about the story of David and Goliath. I would imagine that everybody in this room is super familiar with the story, heard it not just one time, but numerous times, uh, could, could probably tell your favorite parts. Everybody in here is probably so familiar that you do have favorite parts. I have favorite parts. I will tell you that usually when I go back and restudy this lesson, there are new parts that pop out to me, and that's my prayer for us tonight, that regardless, um, I, I got this from Bobby uh, a couple years ago, um, Bobby Rawson at camp, he said, Brad, I, a lot of times before I stand up, I, I pray that somebody here needs to hear something that I'm about to say. And that's, that's been my prayer since, too. I said, man, I'm going to copy that because I believe that's what the Lord wants. But I think tonight, obviously, we're talking about confidence, confidence in our God, and we should definitely have confidence in our God. I will confess to you tonight, I did not have a great day at work today. And a lot of that was because I rely on myself. And, and I'm, I'm a, a control freak. I like to be in control of things. I like to have confidence in what I do. Uh, if my coaches let me down, I let them know about it. And I like to have confidence in them. If my players let me down, I let them know about it. And I like to have confidence in them. And I try to teach them the right things and things. But what we ended up coming back, we always come back to at You Poor Football, is that our confidence is not in some things that we say. Uh, it's not in what people call us or how people label us and things like that. Most of the time, our confidence is in repetition, and not just repetition, but repetition in good reps, like doing things right over and over and over again, saying those things over and over again. And when we do those things over and over again, we find that it's not really that big of a miracle when it shows up on Friday night. Now, the reverse is true. That if we don't go do the work, and I've had this conversation with our coaches and players too, if we don't go and do the work, if we don't have those good repetitions, if we don't do the things that we know we should do, then we should be shocked on Friday night if things do go well, because that is a miracle, okay? And so as I'm reading this to you guys tonight, and we'll do a little bit of reading and I'll stop and, and explain everything, 
I want you to know that this is not something that, that I have a firm grip on. This is something that I struggle with that I think we all do. Having confidence in our God. I told Amanda on the way here, I'm confident in God. I know what he can do. I've read his stories like this right here. What an amazing story this is. I have tons of confidence. My God has brought me to where I am today. And if you knew my story, maybe one day I can, I can share it with you. If you knew my story and how I got to be right here at Brandon tonight, it's amazing. It's a miracle. It's something only God can do, and I can't wait to see what God can do. So inside of me is that I know my God can do things. I'm confident in that. But sometimes I get disconnected from that, and I don't allow him to be who he's supposed to be in my life, and I'm not who I'm supposed to be. And that's what I struggle with. And so as I'm reading this story tonight, I'm telling you there's some things that, that go with that. This story is awesome because just like all good stories, listen to some of the things you're going to find in this story tonight. Adversity, hopelessness versus enormity of a situation. Think about your life, and do you have these things in your life? Disappointment, disappointment disappointment right people disappoint me but it's nothing more disappointing than the people you count on the most and love the most that disappoint you yet they disappoint you yet i disappoint them there's disappointment in this story there's unrealistic approaches and reasoning let that sink in probably have some businessmen and women here tonight probably have professionals in all different careers tonight and all kinds of things like that listen to this unrealistic reasoning. God gave us a brain to reason with. Sometimes we go well beyond what we should do sometimes, right? And I'm stuck on that. I'll, Amanda will remind me sometimes. I'll go, I know God is good, but, and I know God is great, but I know I should have confidence in God, but the bill still got to get paid and this has to happen. And if it really sit back and think and pray about it, how did I get here anyway? How do I have an electric bill to even pay if it wasn't for my God, right? Everything, everything I have that's good, comes from my God. Unrealistic approach, supernatural. Did you know that talking about supernatural things weirds people out? I'm, I'm talking supernatural things now. Like we serve a God who spoke to people through burning bushes and talking donkeys and things of that nature. When you begin nowadays in 2023 to talk supernatural type things and about God in that way, it weirds people out. I figured that out when I became a, a, a preacher. When I began to speak about certain things, people were like, ah, ah they kind of want to get away from that a little bit. Torment and teasing. You'll find torment and teasing in this story. The lie. You know, when the devil tempts us, it seems like he always starts with the lie, the deception. And sometimes he's, he leads it in with there's a seemingly way to win, there's the only way to win, and that's what he wants to get you to focus on, and that's ab absolutely the way to defeat. That's what he wants us to focus on. Do you know that I've spent most of my summer this summer, we had 26 kids. We only have about 35 kids on the roster. We had 26 kids yesterday that took a trip to Columbus to um, get their picture taken for making all of their workouts this summer. They've worked so hard that we went to the Air Force Base and we got our picture taken and 26 out of the 35 kids and out of the rest of the kids, most of them were really close to making all of them. But I've got two kids that I've focused on all summer that have robbed me of my joy, two kids. And those are the two kids I can't get to come, right? And so sometimes the devil will get you to focus on what he wants you to see as a reality just so that he can beat you down and get you away from what's really... You find that in this story. And you also find, again, like I said a minute ago, disappointment from loved ones. And here's one. I don't know if you have this in your life or not. You'll find this in this story for sure, fear. If you'll really put yourself in the shoes of Saul and his army in the face of the Philistines and this giant Goliath, if you will really try to put your feet in those shoes, it's a lot easier to see how much fear we would have versus how we could stand back and go, Saul, you're supposed to be a man of God. You're, you're, you're ruling his people. How could you not send everybody at Goliath with all that you got? And We can say that now because we know the outcome but if we really put ourselves in the shoes of Saul and his men, how many of us would let fear creep in? I'm guilty, right? And so the trick is, and I hope tonight, I hope we can look at some things that maybe stick out to you. I've got a few things jotted down, and I'm just going to go verse by verse. And again, uh, I may have some questions. Uh, I, don't, I don't really know how this will go, but I just hope it will be something that you need to hear tonight. So 
stature matters, okay? It, I, I started reading this story again, and there's all kinds, you know, people argue all kinds of stuff, but Goliath was big. He was a giant, right? Okay, so a lot of people would say that he's about nine feet tall or, or something like that. I've seen everything from, um, I think, a little over seven foot to like nine foot, nine inches or something like that. This dude is big, right? And I think that's really important that, that we see that. Why? I, I tell Amanda all the time, you know, we, we, we talk all the time and we talk about faith and things like that. We're riding up down the road and, and uh, see we're saved by grace through what? Faith. And the kind of faith that God has called us to is not the kind of faith that you what? You see with, right? So we're supposed to have faith in things that are not even seen, right? But the devil is opposite of that, right? So if he's going to come at us and he's going to use something like fear, what's he going to use? He's definitely going to use things that we can see because it's so hard not to believe what you see, okay? And so the, the stature matter. One cubit is 17 to 22 inches is what they, what they tell me. So uh, in, a, in a span, it's supposed to be, I think, from the, finger, the thumb to the fingertip. I, I don't know all that. I, I know this. They, some, somebody smarter than me figured it up. that He was about 9 foot, uh, 3 inches. Uh, some people even had him up to 11 feet, 9 inches. He was a giant. 5,000 shekels is about 125 pounds, and that's uh, the, the coat of mail that, that he would have been wearing. Stature matters. When you're reading the Bible and, you, and you, you see some things, and the Bible takes a minute and takes an opportunity to begin to lay those things out, I think we should stop because it matters. We sing, uh, I'm surprised we didn't sing it a minute ago in, in the Bible schools and stuff. We sing the song about Zacchaeus. He's a wee little man, right? That's a significant part of that story, is it not? So when we see that, we, we stop and look. And so there's Goliath, as big as he is, with all the things that he's got. And to me, when I read that, is that not the representation of the world as we see it today? Okay? Amanda will tell you, I can turn on Fox News, and, and, and in just a moment, I can be just like this right here. Right? Why? I'm looking for giants, staring at them. Okay? And no, don't let somebody come along and say, yeah, but is that really real? I mean, but look, look at it. It's right there. And the news media makes it, embellishes it to where it's even bigger. Stature matters. The, the size of things and how all of those things matter. And I think it matters in this story too because God paints this picture of how the devil shows the Israelites there, that this Goliath, this giant, was just absolutely huge and unbeatable. And so here's the lie. Look down in verse 8. Okay, so we're in 1 Samuel 17. Look down in verse 8. The setup, the lies, kind of what I titled this section right here. And the devil paints it as if victory can only be one way. Listen, Goliath stood and he shouted to the ranks of Israel. Now I'm going to ask you real quick, who is Goliath? When it comes to our God, who is this man? Right? What, what is his authority? Okay? He comes as a Philistine and he shouts uh, to the ranks of Israel. He shouts to the army, to the king, to everyone. He says, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man. In other words, are we not, are we not enemies? And of course, we know uh, we've got the old Western theme going on today. We know the, uh, uh, the way the... the uh, the gun battles used to be settled in the Old West and things like that. It was not abnormal in the Bible for uh, combatants to come out and, and try to settle, thing and, and, and settle things in that way. So what they would call it is their champion, right? So we know that the Philistines had chosen Goliath. That's their guy, okay? So that's the one that they're going to put out front. If he can go and he can win, then this is the lie. This is, this is what they say. It says, choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to uh, fight and kill me, we will become your subjects, but if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. And then the Philistine said, This is the day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. And on hearing the Philistine's word, Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and they were terrified. Did you hear the lie in there? Did you hear it? Goliath, who has zero authority from God, which is why we're here tonight. Right? Christians, we're under the authority of God. We forget that sometimes. Goliath, who is a nobody, but he's nine foot tall, so he's got my attention, right? But authority-wise, he, he's nobody. Yet he stands out there every day and he says, I am Goliath and I'm a Philistine. I am your enemy. You know that to be true. 
It's true. You're the Israelites, right? Pick for you a champion. I'm their champion. We'll get together and we'll bang heads. If I win, this is how to go. If you win, this is how to go. And he sets it up like that's the only way things could happen. And what did the Israelite men do? What did even King Saul do? They believed it. Well, how do we know they believed it? They were terrified. I would be too. This guy's screaming. He's screaming, this is what's going to go down. Who will go and, and fight this guy? And then David is the vessel, verse 12. Now David was the son of the Ephrathite uh, named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. And Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time he was very old. And Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second was uh, Benadab, and the third Shemaiah. And David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So David, we know by the end of the story, David becomes the vessel that God chose. Okay? Now going back and doing some reading, some people said, well, how old is David during this time period? He's called a shepherd boy and all this kind of thing, and, and I'm not real sure what his age was, but uh, a lot of people agree it was somewhere between maybe 17, 18 years old. Okay? Maybe younger or less. Okay? Now think about that. Think about your... Your, your son at that age or your nephew, and he's going back and forth. Verse 16, David gets introduced in this section, verses 16 through about verse 23. David gets introduced to this situation through his father's concern. And I'll tell you a story real quick. I was coaching one time at a school, and I won't name the name of the school, but we started out the year that was my first head coaching job ever, and I was so excited about it. I was fixing to jump in there and change the world, win state championship, right? We started the year 0-10. I've never been 0-10 in anything in my life. Never have I been 0-10 since in anything in my life. I'm telling you, like, if we played 10 games of checkers, I'd find a way to win one of them. I'm just telling you. Luckily, we had 12 regular season games, and we hung on, and we won the last two games of that season, and we finished the season 2-10. and 10. And I know y'all don't think much of that 2-10 and 10 season, but it was really awesome for me to win those last two. It was tough. And it was a long way away from home. And I remember uh, one time I was painting the field. Amanda, Lee, she worked in a, in, a, in a town far away. And so there was a lot of long time away from one another and things like that. And she would bring me supper all the way to the school and stuff while I was cutting grass and different things. And there was a lot of why moments. There was a lot of, God, why is this happening and all that kind of stuff. And I'm lonely moments. And I remember one day I was cutting grass or painting the field or something. And it was like in the middle of the day. And I looked up and I saw this minivan pull into the parking lot of the school. And I thought, oh, just kind of hit my heart. You know, when, when something good happens, you know, and you, you're like, yes, and then you realize, no. You know what I mean? Had one of those moments because that minivan looked just like the minivan that my mom and dad have. And as lonely as I was feeling at that moment, I thought, yes, a friendly face. And then I realized, I'm three hours from my mom and dad in the middle of the day. There's no way... And then my dad stepped out of the van. And so he was bringing me drinks for halftime that week. Son, I brought you drinks for halftime. I thought the boys might want some halftime drinks. Best halftime drinks we ever had that year. And I thought, man, that's cool. My dad drove all the way down here to do that or whatever. And I, and I realized he was doing that for me. But as I'm reading this story, I realized dad didn't just come down there for me. Dad was worried about me. Okay, Dad needed an excuse to find me, right? And so here this vessel, David, Jesse says, hey, I'm worried about my boys. I've heard some news. Things aren't going very well. David, take these provisions. Give them to your, your brothers. But come back and tell me how they're doing. I need to know how they're doing. So that stuck out to me in this lesson too, that sometimes you got to have folks looking out for you, but sometimes those folks looking out for you are, are, are love you so much that they want to do these things for themselves. you got to recognize those things too. So a father's concern gets David down there in the situation. So David does what his father tells him to do. In verse 20 it says, Early in the morning David left the flock in the care of a shepherd. He loaded up and he set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to do its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines, facing each other. And David left the things with the keeper um, of the supplies, and he ran to the battle lines, and he asked his brothers how they were. 
He wanted to report back to his daddy. He said, you know, Jesse had sent him down there. He wanted to know what was going on. And as he was talking to them, Goliath, the Philistine, the champion, the giant, the guy from Gath, he stepped out from the lines and he shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. And whenever the Israelites saw the, the man, they fled from him in great fear. Now, the next part of this story, I think, is really, really important because I struggle with this as a 44-year-old person and, and if maybe somebody here tonight that does too. And I ask all the time, how in the world do we as Christians know what we're supposed to know? We know who our God is. We know who we're supposed to have confidence in. We know what we're supposed to have confidence in. And we read it and we study it and we come to church and we worship it and we do all of those things. Yet we get out in the world and we say these things and do these things. People look at us like we're crazy. Here is a young boy who is a shepherd. He's not a soldier. He's not a battle-hardened guy or whatever. He's a follower of God. And we know that because God has helped him rescue the sheep from the bear and the, and the lion and all those things that he's already done. He's a follower of God. And so he's listening to God and like a young innocent boy, he is soaking in the things that God has taught him. And he goes to give provisions to God's men. These are God's people. These are not strangers. The Philistine recognizes them. The Philistine says, I'm a Philistine and you belong to Saul. Right? You're men of God. The next part is really important. I want you to hear this part. I wrote down, David cannot believe what he sees or hears. This makes a lot of a difference, I'm telling you. When I put these on, it's like I can see clearer now. I had them on my head the whole time. Didn't work as good. You know what I mean? Y'all, I'm just getting used to these. You've got to forgive me. Um, David can't believe what he sees or hears, but he asks for clarification from his brothers, and this is what he gets back from his brothers. David sees this giant and everybody scatters and runs off. David starts asking questions. He doesn't run off with them. He's not running with them like, what are we running from? He stops, he starts asking questions, but then as he starts to ask real questions, his own brother's flesh and blood begin to question his heart. I think when we get out there in the world and we show people who we really are and we give them our heart, they're going to stomp all over it. They're going to think we're crazy. Okay? They're going to ask questions. We've got to be prepared to answer those questions. But we've got to remember story like, stories like this and have confidence that our God is going to deliver us even through that. Because those are difficult times, especially when those questions come from people we love. Especially when, when people question our heart and our motives from people we love, right? Listen to what happens with David right here. Now the Israelites, I'm on verse 25. Now the Israelites have been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He keeps coming out to defy Israel. They're like, David, look what this guy keeps doing. He's scaring us to death right here. And he says, the king will give great wealth to a man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and he'll exempt his family from taxes in Israel. Like, honestly, when I'm reading that, I'm like, whoo, taxes are getting pretty high. I almost had me, you know what I mean? It's getting pretty rough. That, that's a pretty good deal, probably even back then, right? I already got a wife. I'm good on that one though. We're good on that one. I'll just leave it at that. But this is what the king will do. This is how bad of an agent this guy is. This is what David says in return. So David asked the men standing near him. David asked older men. He asked his brothers. He asked the soldiers of Saul, the people that we would look up to, the people defending the nation of God. This is what he's talking to. This is what David, a shepherd boy that doesn't know any difference, this is what he says. He says, what will be done for the man that kills his Philistines and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? He says, this guy's a nobody. King Saul himself couldn't have said it any better. A shepherd boy. Another nobody. Right now I know, we, you know David was anointed and all, all those things, but he's a shepherd boy. He had heard the way the Israelite men should conduct themselves his whole life. And he's out there shepherding sheep, and that's how he's conducting himself. When the bear came, David says later on, I didn't run. When the lion came, I didn't run. I did what my God told me to do. I ran to the fight, and I pulled the sheep out of the mouth. And I did it because I was confident that my God would deliver me. So who is this giant? You say, well, Brad, that's easy for you to say. I mean, you're standing up there preaching the lesson or whatever. No, I'm with you. I've got giants in my life too. But when are we going to question, when are we going to get down on our knees and say, who is this giant that calls me out 
a child of God. Who is this guy? That's one of David's first questions there. So guess what? They treated him like anybody would treat their little brother. They repeated it to him, and they told him, this is a bad dude. This is what will happen if somebody kills this guy. And then, listen to this. David's oldest brother heard him speaking with the men and talking with the men, and he got angry. And he asked David, he said, Why have you come down here? And whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? David, why are you down here, and why are you not doing your job? You need to be minding your business. You need to, I think nowadays we say, stay in your lane. And I know how conceited you are, David, and I know how wicked your heart is. You came down here only to watch the battle. In other words... How did those guys think the battle would go? They had Goliath winning. He said, you didn't come down here to help us out. You didn't come down here to bring us provisions. You come down here to watch us lose. That's what he told his little brother. So Daniel, in Daniel 3, 16 through 18, it reminds me, it's one of my favorite kind of go-tos this year. And anytime you speak somewhere, you always got to say some really cool names. All right? So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I did that, right? Y'all like those names? Those are good names. Uh, Nicodemus is a good one. I'm not going to talk about him tonight, but I just like to say really cool names to see who's paying attention, see who's still awake, okay? Daniel chapter 3, starting at verse 16, we see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. One of the best lines, I think, in the Bible. Listen to this. And I asked a man the other day driving down the road, I said, you ever wondered why the story doesn't include Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and like all of their buddies from that town? They're by themselves. Seems like. I mean, it could have been more. The Bible doesn't say, but, right, it was just those three. Or it could have been they have really cool names. Here we go, okay? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I don't think that's it. I think they were by themselves. They're talking to King Nebuchadnezzar, another really cool name if you're paying attention. Listen to what they say. I'm going to get a little more serious in just a second. Verse 17, this is the go-to line, one of the, one of the best lines you'll hear in the Bible. And it wasn't just a line. They lived it, and they believed it. He said, if we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. They were totally respectful to King Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 18, this is the best part. Y'all listen. But even, how many of you already know what I'm fixing to say? Any of you? This is really good. If you want to have confidence in your God, you want to know what confidence in your God looks like, listen to this. I want this kind of confidence. I ain't there yet. Listen to what they said. But even if he does not, we want you to know. This is our turn to speak, O king. This is our turn, right? You had all the authority. You've you've sentenced us to the furnace. Our turn to talk. We want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. If our God chooses not to come in and save us, we still won't worship you. What an awesome confidence in the Lord right there. I think David is basically saying the same things. Guys, who is this Philistine that we should bow down to him? He's a nobody. He's a nobody. So David begins to act in faith, starting in verse 29. And so David replies back to, um, he replies back to, to his, um, his brothers and the different ones that were questioning him and uh, begins to speak and begins to talk. In verse 32 it says this, David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant, talking about himself, will go and fight him. And Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. And he tells the story about the lion and about the bear. And he says, just like the lion and the bear, this Philistine will be just like them. But he says... This is the point, verse 37. It's not the lion and it's not the bear and it's not the Philistine. Verse 37, he says, The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. It's the Lord. It's His plan. It's His power. I'm just the vessel. Then Saul, we know, tried to dress David And we know how how that worked out. None of the stuff that Saul had fit David, and he couldn't move, and he was way down, and he didn't have those things. So the next thing I wanted to point out was weapon for weapon. If you look, and I know 
Um, I've heard Wesley talk about weapons and things a lot in here and different things like that, and we got to see some weapons at um, the military base in Meridian yesterday and different things or whatever, and got to hear some of the pilots talk about the capabilities of these weapons, and uh, weapons nowadays are, are, are ridiculous, I'll just tell you that, right? Um, I heard a story one time about a guy in Iraq that right before he surrendered, uh, he saw a Tomahawk cruise missile come down the streets of Baghdad and hang a left. That's, that's pretty serious, right? But we're talking about weaponry here too. We're talking about swords, helmets, shields, shield, uh, shield, uh, shield bearers, and all those different things, whatever. Weapon for weapon, how does it look for David right now? Weapon for weapon. Now, this is the part where David goes and he gets five smooth stones and he has a slingshot. He tells Saul, no, I, I got what I need. I'll go in and fight or whatever. You remember what Saul's got on, right? Saul's got on the leg protectors. He's got on the helmet. He's got on all the, and he's got a dude that goes out in front of him that holds a shield. He's got this javelin that is really long and all that kind of stuff. I mean, this guy is decked out for war. And David, probably by all accounts, looks like a shepherd boy with a slingshot and five stones, right? So for us, for us, I mean, in our everyday life, we would reason that's not good. That's not an even, even battle. It's not going to happen. Um, yet we're amazed. We watch sports. Now, obviously, I'm a sports guy, okay? Sean Thomas likes to come in and turn on the TV and see who's winning, and that's who he roots for, right? Which is funny because I like to see that play out sometimes because sometimes a team that jumps out and lead ends up losing, right? And I go, yeah, that's what you get for rooting for what you thought was going to be the winner, right? But sometimes, you know, we see, it, we see it on the football field especially. We see a gigantic big team, and we see a little team, and everybody puts their, their praise and their predictions on the big team. But oftentimes what happens? The little team wins. We, we're shocked by that. God's going to use that right here. Verse 43, I want to point this out. So David, with his slingshot and the stones, he goes out and he, he approaches... This is what Saul says as David approaches. Listen to what he says. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. He said, Come here, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and to the animals. You know, looking at that situation, if we could just stop and sit back and put ourselves maybe just on a hillside and watch this start to go down. What would your reaction be if you were just sitting there watching this go down? Here's this young boy, he comes up and he begins to talk and you see him milling around and he's trying armor on and you're like, what, what is he doing? Is he playing? Is he playing war? What, what's going on? And then he, he takes the armor down and he goes and he picks stones and then you see the two start towards one another. How are you feeling right now as you watch that? Are you like Sean Thomas or are you choosing sides? Have you already chosen the giant and that kind of thing? Now here's the deal. Pretend real quick like David is your son or your grandson, right? Like somebody a little bit closer than just a stranger we're about to watch. Are you going to let him go? Think about that. I mean, seriously, what would you do? There, 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 there's a situation going on out in the street right now, and your son is in this room, and he's trained, and he can go out to the assailant. The assailant's got a, a, an AR-15 or something like that, and he's got a pocket knife. Are you going to send him? Are you going to try to talk him out of it? Let's be honest. That's kind of the situation going on right here. Now, I read somewhere where Saul said, man, if, you, if you've been chosen by God, you go. All power, God be with you and all power be with you. But I, I don't know that Saul... I, not what I've read, and you may know more than me, but I, what I've read... I, I felt like I feel like Saul just said, you know, if that's what you want to do, you go do it. If it turns out good, it turns out good. If it don't, it don't. I, I don't know how I don't know how Saul can be, and he, and he could be. But one minute with his armies, they're scared and they're running to the hills, and then this shepherd boy comes up and goes, "Hey, I killed a lion, I killed a bear." He goes, "All right, we'll go kill the Philistine." I, I don't I don't see Saul going. We're going to win this, right? They know this. This David is not just somebody in, in the Bible that they're reading about. In 2 Kings chapter 6, I'm going to go back to what we're talking about, our, our sight. In 2 Kings chapter 6, I read this not long ago. This is one of my kind of go-tos here lately too. So I'm going to share it with you. It talks about 
the looks being deceiving and our faith not being by sight. Most of us in here, if we wrote it on a piece of paper, dropped it in a box, our prediction between this young man and this nine-foot giant, most everybody in here would write giant and walk out the door. Most of you would be willing to sign your name. And I say you, I'm talking about me too. But our faith is not supposed to be by sight. So listen to this, 2 Kings chapter 6, starting in verse 14 through 18. So Elisha has been sharing war plans, and he's made the king really upset. That's kind of the, the picture going on right here, okay? So God has been, been helping Elisha to help the Israelites, and he's been sharing war plans, and now the king's done figured it out. And so he's fixing, he's fixing to take his whole army and come down on Elisha and take him out, right? And so this, verse 14, uh, so the king, he sent horses and chariots and strong force there, and they went by night and they surrounded the city. Now, when Elisha's servant, when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? I'm not sure that's exactly what he said. Could you imagine hearing that your boss has been sharing war secrets and you step outside and the enemy's at the front door and you're surrounded? That's the picture here, right? Horses and chariots and fire and all these things and they've done slipped in by night and they thought they went to bed and all. And so the servant goes, what do we do? That's a pretty big freak out moment. That's exactly how life happens too, isn't it? You go to bed sometimes at night and everything's fine and then you wake up the next day and you're like, what just happened? How did that happen so fast? What do you do? Listen to Elisha's prayer right here. This is what I want you to pray for me, and I'll pray it for you, okay? This is what he says. He says, what shall we do, the servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Huh? Did y'all hear what he said? Those that are with us are more than them. So if I'm the servant, I'm going, it's me and you. Right? But he said, don't be afraid. There's more with us than with them. And so this is what he prays. This is what you got to pray for me. He begins to pray, Lord, open his eyes. Open his eyes. And his eyes were open, and this is what he saw. Listen to this. Skip on down in verse 16. He says, the prophet says, don't be, I mean, verse 17. He said, and Elisha prayed, open his eyes. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and the hills were full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And as the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. And so the army was struck with blindness. That's the God we worship. Is it not the God we worship? Is that not the same one? Spelled the same? Worship the same? Not, is that not the God that we worship? Yet we let every little thing in our life separate us from that same confidence. I'm nowhere near the confidence of Elisha, but I would be okay with it if you treated me like the servant. You said, God, open Brad Gray's eyes so he can see the army behind the one that he thinks the giant. Right? Because we serve one that's way back there. Do we really believe that? We serve one that not everybody can see. Do we really believe that? Do we have that kind of confidence? Here's the main point I want to get to tonight, and I hope I haven't talked way too much. Y'all stop me if I, if I need to. The main point. This is one of my favorite things. A baseball coach that I worked with one time, y'all can imagine us telling this story to kids a lot of times, running to the face of the giants and things like that. But he told the story, and I went back and read the story. It caused me to read the story. I didn't realize this. Listen to this and see if you pick up on it. I'm in verse 45, and I'm going to read through verse 49. See if you hear it. Hopefully it does to you something that makes you want to get out of that pew and go fight for the Lord. Listen to this. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, all the worldly things, all the things that you think are good, all the things that you have confidence in, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And this very day I will give the carcass of the Philistine army to the birds and to the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And all those, uh, uh, all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword, it's not by spirit, it's not by the things you have confidence in, it's that the Lord saves, and the battle is the Lord's, and He will give all, all into our hands. Verse 48, as the Philistine moved closer, you got to know that made that giant mad, right? This little boy basically taking his words and turning them back on him and saying, hey, but this time I'm speaking with real authority. 
What you said is what you said, but this time I'm speaking truth. And if anybody's head's getting cut off today, it's going to be yours. And I'm coming at you by the authority of the Lord. This is what he says right here. So the giant comes towards David. Listen to this. As the giant moved closer to attack David, David ran quickly toward the battle line. He wasn't inching up there. He didn't have confidence like, boy, I hope I get him. Did you hear it? He ran. To the battle line. What confidence that he would run to the battle line. I forget where I got this. It may have been on social media somewhere, but I read somewhere where um, the buffalo out west would uh, see a storm coming across the plains, and the buffalo would herd up and they would run towards the storm. And the point was they would run towards the storm, and once they got in the storm, they'd run in the storm, the storm would pass, and then they would be in green pastures, and everything was fine. But domesticated cattle that rely on people and other things and that kind of nature, the storm would come up, and it would scatter, and they would just run, and they would run, and they would run. And the storm was always approaching, and they were still running. You ever felt like that? David ran to the battle. He knew he was going to win. And it had nothing to do with the weapons he took or his abilities or any of those things. So we know how the story ends tonight. The facts of the story. Y'all remember some of the things that we talked about in the beginning there? About the adversity and the lies and the shame. I mean, not the, not the shame, but the... The, the different things that the brothers did and all that kind of stuff. The, the facts are in the results of this story, okay? In the entire story, we see how it was laid out. We see the giant. We see, we see how the odds were stacked against David, or so it seemed. But honestly, God had a purpose for David, and that battle was won before it ever started. And what he needed was a servant. What he needed was somebody willing to follow his battle plans. That's what he needed. And of all the people that God could have chose, he chose a guy like David, a servant. He chose someone like us, same God, right? I would assume. Confidence in God. Confidence in God. I'm going to finish tonight with just a couple things. In that story, you see one individual. I can't think of another. I see Jesse. I like what Jesse was doing. Jesse was worried. Jesse was concerned. We would be too. But out of all the characters, I see one individual that was doing what God called him to do. And listen to this. That shepherd changed an entire nation. We're reading that story today, right? And we read that story a lot. But it's not just a giant and a shepherd boy. There's so many things going on in that story. Flip over if you would. I want, to, I want to read to you tonight as we finish up Psalms chapter 40. Psalm chapter 40. Psalm chapter 40. Same David. Years later, right? Here's a boy that fights Goliath right through the power of God. Here's David. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit and the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock and he gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us, none can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. I want you to pay close attention to verses 6 through 10 as we finish up. Listen to the confidence that David has. David said, Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but my ears you have opened. He wants us to hear us. David learned that through everything that he ever gone through. He's to this point where he's matured. He's learned that. He says, burn offerings and sin offerings, that's not what you want. You want us to hear you. 
Then I said, Here I am. I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. God, you want me to be available. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. David wants to do what God wants him to do. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your savings help. And your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. I'm going to stop right there tonight. You can finish reading um, through chapter, um, through verse 17 on your own, which is a, a really good uh, prayer that David has, and it just shows how his heart has been created and it's been built, and it's been used by God repeatedly. Now, we could also stand up here and talk about times where David failed, and he failed tremendously, and we, we could talk about those stories too. But our topic was confidence in God, and that's the kind of confidence that we first have to desire. And David says, God, you, you don't want all the sacrifices. You don't want all the offerings. You, don't want, you want us to hear you. You want us to obey you. You want us to serve you. You want us to keep your law in, in our heart and love it because we love you. And God, that's where our confidence comes from. So you go back to all those things we talked about of, of the things that we have confidence in. We have confidence in reading our Bibles. We have confidence in encouraging each other. We have confidence in prayer. But we have confidence that the God that David served is the God that we serve. And that should give us all great confidence. And I'm telling you, as soon as I walk out that door, fear and doubt and all of those things creep into me just like they do you. We have to go back to the fundamental. and Go back and remember that just like we serve that same God, we're people just like these other people and other characters in this Bible, too. I'm going to pray for us tonight, and uh, if there's any questions or anything before I pray, uh, I, you know, I'll be glad to try to answer those or whatever. But I will say, uh, if not, I, I appreciate you guys letting me come and speak. Uh, I really, really enjoy doing that, and I appreciate that. And I'm serious about the prayers for me and Amanda and our family and the things and the struggles that we have, and, and we'll pray for you guys, too, here at this congregation. And uh, we just hope everything just gets better and better for you guys. And uh, thankful again for this opportunity. Okay, let's pray. Our God in heaven, Lord, we just thank you for being our God, first of all, Lord. And we just, um, we know that you're, you're our God. We know that you're David's God. We know that, um, that you have a plan and a purpose for every one of us. Uh, we know that you're looking for servants, Lord. And we pray that you would help us to have a servant's heart. Uh, help us, God, to... Um, uh, seek to serve you in everything we say and do. Uh, but God, help us to have great confidence in, in uh, what you've asked us to do, that when we go out there in the world and we're challenged, that your word would be in our heart, uh, that we would have a ready remembrance, that in, in the, the most loving way we can even tell those that call themselves our enemies why we are who we are and why we can be as bold as we can be. God, you know our hearts, and you know it has nothing to do with our strength, uh, but everything to do with your strength. God, we just thank you for the people that worship here, and we pray that you would bless them and continue to help them. And we just ask you all these things in Christ's name. Amen.